Thanks everybody for coming to see my talk. I know there are four tracks, so it makes the choice difficult. Especially thank you, uh, sitting on the stairs and over there. Uh, I, hope, uh, I hope you won't, uh, won't regret it. Okay, so my name is Radan. Uh, I come from Zagreb. And today I want to talk to you about battling complexity, especially in uh, very large and complex projects. Uh -huh. Okay, I need to be closer. Okay. Um, all right, so I work as a technical uh, lead at TopTel. And TopTel being a 100% remote company, I work from home. And I also have a dog, which looks something like this. He's very, um, very critical uh, of my work. Um, and I would, actually, I would actually prefer to spend the next 20 minutes talking about dogs. And it'd probably be a more interesting talk. Uh, but that was rejected. Uh, so I have to talk about engineering. <coughs> and so actually the work that I do with uh, Carlos, that's his name, uh, at TopTel, is what got me thinking about all the complexity. Uh, because this, the project that I work on is quite large and complex. It powers pretty much every aspect of, um, of TopTel's business, which is, which is pretty large. Um, and it says the project has grown through seven years of development, through contributions of hundreds of developers. And right now, we're counting over 70,000 commits, which should give you some idea of the scale uh, of the project. Um, before, and any advice, um, pretty much most of the advice that I'm giving you is from my experience working on this particular application. Before that, I worked on, let's say, small to medium um, applications. Um, before I continue, uh, I would like to ask you, for a show of hands, uh, who here gets excited at the idea of taking over support for a legacy, for a large legacy application? <laughs> uh, who uh, are you trolling me? Or <laughs> okay, so I had one hand. Yeah, legacy applications are pretty bad, uh, but they don't. Uh, they don't. Uh, He's my colleague, by the way. That's why he's, uh, he's also a top dog. That's why he's taking pictures. Don't mind him. Uh, okay. uh, <laughs> so they don't start like that. Um, every time you, you, know, you start, okay. uh, every time you start, you're full of hope. Um, you're full of, you, know, you have a grand vision of uh, how good this application will be, how much of an excellence in engineering it will be. Uh, but then as you work, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't turn out so well. Uh, somewhere along the way, things, you know, they work, but uh, maybe they don't, uh, they don't work as, as well as you expected. And um, quite often, it's because of the complexity that uh, crept in on the small door. Um, a legitimate question at this point is, what kind of, what kind of complexity I'm talking about? Um, and I think there are two main, kind, two main types of complexity in software projects. Um, many divisions, but the division I want to talk about is uh, the domain complexity at first, which is something that comes with the problem domain. And uh, it is basically is what it is. There's nothing we can do about it. Um, we just have to deal with it. Uh, the other kind is system complexity, which is something that through our own uh, creativity, we build into the project by being very, very smart. Uh, and that is what we create, what we make it to be. And we can definitely control it. And we should control it. Um, and I think for most projects, it's not that we don't care. We care. It's not that we didn't take the time to educate. Most of us are here because you know, we, we enjoy this field. So we educate ourselves. It's just that. There's a saying um, that the road to hell is paved with good, uh, good uh, intentions. And I think we can s say that the road to complex, complex systems is paved with well-implemented features. If you look at a feature on its own, um, it works pretty well. It, um, you, you, you did a good job, except maybe in one or two cases, you made some very small compromise <coughs> for purely pragmatic reasons. Um, and sometimes those trade-offs are OK. But small compromises, 
small compromises. In retrospective, I should have probably put the receiver on the side where I would be standing, because then it might be catching the clicks uh, better. Uh, so small compromises, definite, small compromises add up, and in large projects, it becomes especially problematic because you make one or two small trade-offs on each feature, and in a small app, they're usually isolated. In a large app, they start to overlap just because of the size of the application. So you start having places which are in between the features, which are influenced by 30, 40 trade-offs, which is not something you would do um, intentionally. But it just happens through time. And it, that's why um, I think we say that large projects act as a magnifying glass for all the trade-offs we make. I, I wanted to put a quote from a famous engineer, but I didn't find anything <laughs> I could use. So I just quoted myself. Apparently, you can do that, which makes things much simpler. Uh, so I want to talk about cons consequences of the trade-offs. And there are many, many consequences, many aspects of this, because the topic is very large and complex, pun intended. Um, there are these main consequences uh, that I want to focus on. And I'll be scratching the surface. Um, basically, I want to talk about the things that I noticed usually, that usually go unnoticed and have a large cost associated with that as the project grows. So the first one is that it's um, hard to implement a new feature. So a feature that would be quite easy to do in a small project uh, ends up being quite hard to implement uh, in a large project. And I think uh, oftentimes it's because um, certain best practices are either miss in the beginning of the project and through development are either misunderstood or neglected. Um, why that leads to bad things? Um, I think we need to look at what best practices are. So I went to Wikipedia and I found this definition that it's a commercial or professional procedure that is accepted and or prescribed as being uh, correct or most effective. Um, and there's an, I wrote an alternative version of that which I think clarifies it a bit more and that is that the best practice is an approach to solving a given problem that has empirically uh, been shown to have a high chance of success. Best practices are not invented in, a, in an academical setting. Uh, they are discovered by the fact that multiple people on multiple projects through time um, have run into similar problems and found similar solutions which worked for them. And then through events like these where they shared their experiences, uh, certain things became identified as, hey, this, this has worked really well for solving this class of problems on many, many projects it will probably work on other projects. Let's call it a, you know, a best practice. At this point, you might be asking yourself, what am I talking about, software project and chance? Um, we are engineers. We don't deal with chances. We know what we're doing. We're building the systems deliberately in a deterministic fashion. There's no place for chance. And I think that's, that's wrong and often neglected. And the reason is that um, out of many factors uh, that influence the project, um, let's say these are the known factors. So these are the factors that you are aware of, or let's say requirements. Um, then if these are the known factors, these are the unknown factors. And they actually have, they, through the life of a project, especially with a big project, they're going to have a much, much bigger influence. And they're going to be a much bigger threat to your project. It's going to be a requirement that somebody that just appear through the development, or as stakeholders are using the system, they discover new requirements and they give it to you. And the only way you can deal with unknown things, you can't deal with a deliberate deterministic fashion, you need to deal with it um, by maximizing the chances that whatever problem comes, your code base is going to be ready for it. So now I want to just touch on a few practices which I think are um, neglected or badly understood. And the first one is dry. Uh, do not repeat yourself. And it's a very, very good practice. It means that um, you, you don't want to have code. Basically, you don't want to have code repeating. However, quite often, now this, uh, this code example is very trivial because I, I can't put uh, a large example. I can't spend 10 minutes explaining the setup of applications. So 
user imagination to imagine something much more complex. Um, these two lines of code, even though they're doing the exact same calculation, they're just adding 10%, they should not be dried because they have a different, uh, different purpose. They have a different meaning. Uh, and of course, when they should be dried is uh, when they have the exact same purpose. Because if you dry the upper example, I guarantee you at some point somebody is going to come and going to change uh, the premium markup. At that point, you're going to have to de-dry all the places that are using this function that you extracted. And in a large project, uh, you're either going to be facing a very long amount of work because you have hundreds and hundreds of places relying on this dry function. You're going to have to go back and point it to a different function, or you're going to hack your way around it. And depending on your stakeholders and how understanding they are, or your bosses, you might resort to hacking. And then you'll do it again and again and again. And a year later, you're going to find yourself with a very uh, hard to uh, work in application. So the point is that don't uh, repeat yourself. It's usually defined as every piece of knowledge must have a single unambiguous authoritative representation within a system. But the way it usually gets understood is that if the code looks the same, um, dry it. When in fact, you should only dry the code that is serving the same purpose uh, and not just uh, looking very similar. OK, so that's for drying. The other thing is, this is, a, this is not actually such a bad piece of code. Uh, this is from a Rails application. doesn't matter. Um, it's actually in quite a lot of tutorials you're going to be directed to write such a code. The problem is that email format is something that will very likely be the same in 10, 20, 30 years. That has not changed much. Whereas the requirement for contact name to be present there is very likely to change next week, the week after, when somebody thinks of it. And even worse, it's going to be changed only for certain use cases. You're going to have a, a requirement that, um, that when admin creates a, a, a company record, the contact name should not be required because he doesn't know it yet. The good way is to split it. So you have um, to extract the service. So you put one validation, the very solid one, the slow changing one, you put it on the model, and you put the fast changing one into a higher layer. And the best practice here, which is often I, I haven't heard it that often, is separating by speed of change. Um, different um, parts of code have different speed of changing. And because of that, they have uh, very different requirements. And if you separate it, not only will it be easier to change, you will be able to um, optimize those parts of the code bases for this very specific thing. You can, you can do different things when you know that, a certain, that the model will be extremely solid. And you can have a lot of parts of the code depending on their, its interface because you've deliberately selected things which you know are slow to change. And you, you put the fast changing thing into the higher layer, uh, suddenly there's less things depending on that, and suddenly it's easier to change, which means you, may have to, you don't have to make so many compromises. So, OK, that's for the first consequence. The, the other is hard to figure out exactly what is going on. Uh, this was a bit of a surprise to me. Um, with smaller applications, even if it wasn't so well designed, usually I had the understanding of it loaded in my head at all times just for my day job working at it. So if somebody comes to me and says, hey, if I do this, what will the application do? Or, or why did the application do this particular thing? Just off the top of my head, I can reconstruct it and explain, oh, yeah, that's because this, this, and this. Whereas in a large application, with Toptal's case, what happened to me, somebody would come and ask me that question. And I would say, OK, you know what? Let me just quickly check in the code uh, so I, I'm, I'm not lying to you. And then I go and open the code. And then I come back and say, you know what? Actually, give me half an hour. <laughs> I'm going to get back to you. And then I start digging through the code. And then I, I call um, some colleagues, hey, what's going on here, to figure it out. And the consequence, that's also the consequence of complexity. And quite often, it's uh, because of how things are named. Um, we know that 
the only two hard things in computer science are naming things and cache invalidation. And especially with complex domains, it's extremely important to use the names from the problem domain. I, I think it's so important that my next point is exactly the same, uh, using like valuable uh, space. And um, if needed, maintain a glossary if it's not a well-known domain. So what do I mean by that? Um, some names are too generic. So if you have a user manager, anything could go in there. Um, you want to be quite specific and want to use something from the problem domain. So you want to say it's a sign up user application manager. And by the way, this is also going to do wonders for when new developers come to the project. Because when you say user manager, it's basically a license to put absolutely anything in there. Um, whereas the other thing kind of directs you to uh, what should belong there. On the topic of language for problem domain, um, let's say you're building an application for uh, conferences. You might be uh, tempted to, let's say, call um, an entity lecturer, whereas it should really be a conference speaker. They mean almost the same thing, except in all the conversations, normally it's referred to as a speaker. And uh, if you don't do that, you're going to find yourself constantly translating from stakeholder language to your own language. And, uh, but don't go uh, overboard. If you need to, you can have a specific name, like talks timetable, but don't do that if you have a perfectly valid and understandable domain name, uh, like schedule. Naming things is also very important for discovering um, where things are in the code base. And you really need to optimize for the uh, discovery. I hardly ever use the tree view in the editor. It's impossible because there's thousands of files there. I, I use the fuzzy search. And was, I need something, I just open the fuzzy search and I start guessing, hmm, where could this be? And I start typing in. And if the code base, if the entities are well organized and uh, well named, usually first, second, or maybe third guess at worst is the correct guess. And for guessing well, it's extremely important to follow the single responsibility principle. It's important everywhere, but it's extremely important in large projects. Because if you have, if you open up and you have like 20 possible places where a functionality could be, um, it's going to be very helpful if the names of there are very specific and it's very easy to understand what's in there because you won't have time to open all of them. Um, what starts happening in large projects is that somebody doesn't realize, they do a quick search, they don't find the functionality and they start to implement exactly the same functionality in another part of the code. It's just, it's, it's, so, it's so vast. Um, and, and it makes um, a lot of sense, you know, you wouldn't... Swiss Army Knives, they're very good, uh, but you know, if you, got, if you w walked into a car mechanics shop and you had a bunch of Swiss Army Knives on the table, uh, you wouldn't be so happy. You want them to have very, very specific tools. Uh, the last point is, the last consequence is it's hard to improve the architecture, which is very important because your requirements will change. Um, either because of new stuff, somebody thought of new stuff, or because uh, you will just gain new insight from working on the problem. At that point, what you need to do is refactor, except in a large, in a large and complex application, it's not so easy. Refactoring is usually local. What you need to do is you need to do large-scale refactoring which is like normal refactoring, except much more, uh, much more dangerous. Uh, some examples would be uh, renaming a class or a variable that's used throughout the system. So it's maybe used in 500, 600 places. Or uh, applying some, pat some pattern you learned at a conference or somewhere that would, imp if only you knew it at the beginning, before you implemented these 100 classes using the approach you did, it would just make things so much better. So it's a sweeping change that's a problematic. Or moving a feature between subsystems as the project evolves, um, boundaries with one systems become hard. And you will not want to do that because you don't have, you don't have time. Well, to that I say refactoring is one of cost. Working around it is perpetual. So at some point you're going to reach the code. It's going to become more expensive not to refactor it. Um, it's risky. Well, if it's risky to refactor it, then it's also risky to add innovative features, um, which means that your application is going towards complacency. Uh, you, you can use that to frame it as an investment in the future. It's especially useful if you need to convince your boss to, um, 
to allow you to do that. And you might say the state is OK. Well, it's not. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, and it's not that hard. You need high test coverage. If you don't have high test coverage, um, get to that first. You need a few peaceful days. Agree with your colleagues to, um, to cover you. Uh, explore the code base. You re load the relevant pieces in your mind so that you understand the parts you will refactor as if it's a small application interwined into a larger one. And then do it trying to find breaking points where you can ship it to production. Um, this actually brings me to the end of my talk. Um, and at this point, some of you might be thinking, uh, this is nothing new. He didn't really show anything revolutionary. He just talked about some best practices, uh, highlighted some of the things he noticed working on a large application. And that is actually maybe the, the most important, important point of my talk, uh, that sometimes you don't need uh, a radical new approach. You need to do what you're already doing, except you need to do it much, much better. Um, a good analogy you can find in sports, if you, if you have a really good amateur team playing a professional team, they are probably doing the same things. They, they don't, the professional team don't know something secret. They, they're doing the same actions, except the professionals are executing it at a much higher level. They're not making mistakes. It's flowing so much more smoothly, and they're annihilating the, um, the, the, the amateur team. And so quite often, I think that's neglected, that we're doing it right. We just need to do it much, much better. Thank you. Are you talking, I mean, this is the situation that you're describing now in terms of uh, the modeling app, like the various things? Yeah, it's a, it's a monolith app. Uh, but I think, so we are now. We're extracting, we're extracting services. Yeah, no, the microservices, I intentionally let them out because it's a hot topic on here. It's not just like a monolith versus microservices, but there are other ways that architecture changes can help with complexity. Yes, I agree. Uh, at some point, you need to do that. Except if you're, if, you, if you're, before you start making the changes, if what you have is not raised to the highest possible level, you're going to carry a lot of problems. Because I'm, I'm looking at a system as a whole. Uh, so a lot of these things, whatever the system is organized, however it's broken down, they still exist because you're organizing the system as a whole. It's, it's a one service towards the users, usually. <laughs>